thorium, 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 thorium. What are these thorium reactors? Hey there, it's Elena, your friend in nuclear physicist, and today we are finally discussing about thorium reactors. I'm gonna be focusing this discussion on thorium as a fuel and specifically for the LFTR design. We're gonna be breaking this video down into seven categories, discussing about fuel abundance, safety, economics, efficiency, waste, proliferation, and the current status of the LFTRs around the world. Before we even get started, let's explain what the thorium reactors are. So LFTR, as I said, liquid fluoride thorium reactors are basically a molten salt type of reactor, meaning that the fuel inside the core is actually in a liquid form in a salt kind of formation that circulates inside the core. It is hot and acts as a fuel and coolant at the same time, meaning that the heat from this liquid fuel that is circulating inside the core is being transferred to the heat exchanger and therefore uh, being transferred to the rest of the components and electricity is produced similarly to any other type of reactor. So this is sort of the biggest difference from the typical reactor types that we are discussing, where the fuel is solid in fuel assemblies that are structured in a specific geometry inside the reactor. So here we have kind of a different composition that provides potential benefits and also some disadvantages in the molten salt reactor type. And molten salt is sort of a bigger category under which thorium reactors lie because you can have molten salt reactors uh, having, for example, uranium fuel, not necessarily only thorium. However, it has been proven that thorium reactors better work with molten salt designs. Therefore, these are the ones that we're going to be considering in the rest of the discussion. So first off, what is thorium and how is it different from uranium? So thorium in itself is abundant on Earth in uh, the isotope thorium-232, which is the one that is the most abundant, and the isotope itself is not fissile, meaning that it will not fission once a neutron hits it, like for example the uranium-235 does. So its behavior is uh, similar to uranium-238, which will capture a neutron and basically transmute into another element. So in the case of thorium-232, uh, when a neutron hits it, it will capture the neutron, uh, transmute into protactinium-233 that will decay into uranium-233 and then the uranium-233 is actually a fissile material similarly to uranium-235, meaning that if a neutron hits it, it will actually split into two smaller atoms producing energy at the same time, which is a fission energy and hence how we have energy production from thorium reactors. Therefore, thorium as itself is not being used as a fuel, but being used as a, let's say, step before the fuel is produced inside the reactor core. There's two ways that can be produced. Uh, the two uranium-233 can be produced inside the core or outside and then placed inside the core as a fuel for the thorium reactors. So let's get into number one, which is fuel abundance. We recently hear that uh, thorium is much more abundant on Earth than uranium is, and this is partially true. So when people talk about the abundance of thorium, they usually refer to the crust of the Earth and the presence of thorium there, where it is true that thorium is around three times more abundant than uranium is. However, these discussions usually don't take into consideration the uranium that exists underwater. The reason why this is not taken into consideration it is because as of now we don't mine uranium that exists underwater because it is not economically efficient. However, in the future, once the uranium, uh, let's say, abundance that we have on the crust of the earth is going to reduce, this technology mining uranium from the oceans might be economically more attractive and therefore we will be able to do that. Even though thorium is uh, more abundant on earth, on the crust of the earth, uh, as of now, and it is more environmentally better to mine than uranium is. Its abundance is not that significant compared to that of uranium. However, the abundance of uranium underwater is around 80,000 times more than that of thorium, which is pretty much non-existent. Therefore, it is important to understand the abundance from all the aspects that it concerns and to make the decision moving forward as to either if one wants to switch for thorium or remains with the technology that is already mature and try to make it more economically competitive while mining uranium from the seas. Moving on to the second point, which regards to the safety of the LFTR reactors. And these safety features are more associated with the molten salt reactors in general and not so particular to the thorium fuel itself. However, since the thorium is going to be probably used with these type of reactors, it is important uh, to provide this information as well. 
So Moldus Auto Reactors in general have a lot of uh, safety inherent features which make them very attractive as a reactor design uh, to be built in the future. Some of them are, for example, an inherent negative reactivity coefficient, meaning that the reactor by its design doesn't allow the reactivity, the power to go high and uncontrollably and cause, for example, a nuclear accident in case of, uh, let's say, things go out of the operational conditions, which is very positive. And it is pretty much what the generation four reactors are having as one of their goals for the future, to have these passive safety features that don't really need anyone actively pressing a stop button or handling this uh, whole situation. Another important thing to mention is that compared to, for example, the pressurized water reactors that we use now, these multisont reactors don't operate under high pressures. Uh, therefore, they are more safe in a sense and things that relate to high pressure designs are not relevant uh, to these kind of reactors. Hence, uh, problems like that would not be an issue in uh, molten salt reactors. Another thing to mention is the fact that fission product buildup is not also a concern in these reactors as a lot of fission products can actually be extracted from the molten salt while it's circulating and uh, the reactor is in operation, as in, for example, the xenon which is a poison, as we call it, inside the reactor core and can actually uh, create a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, imbalance inside the reactor and power fluctuations, which can cause problems uh, during operation or accident conditions. Hence, it is then yet another good uh, safety feature of this uh, type of reactor. Sort of a disadvantage when it comes to the safety aspect of molten salt reactors is the fact that their melting temperature is quite high, around 5 to 600 degrees Celsius. Therefore, under normal operational conditions, they usually operate at quite high temperature, meaning that in case, for example, of an accident where we have uh, no electricity, therefore no heating provided into the reactor for a prolonged period of time, there is a danger and there is a risk of the molten salt core pretty much freezing uh, because the conditions have dropped in a temperature below the melting temperature of the of the fuel itself. This, of course, can cause a lot of problems from uh, destroying equipment such as pumps or heat exchangers uh, through which uh, the salt is flowing or creating delays and uh, even more budget problems uh, in order to be start up uh, again. Moving on to the third aspect of these reactor designs and here we are going to discuss about the economics. So typically for light water or pressurized water reactors, which are the reactors we are currently using, the utilization of the fuel and the efficiency in this utilization is around 1% of the fuel that is being mined and the fuel that is being basically consumed and burnt inside the reactor. Meaning that we typically mine uranium-238, then we have to enrich it uh, into not such high enrichment percentage and this enrichment is the one that's mostly used to fission inside in the reactor and therefore the rest of the fuel is basically being discarded as waste without really being used. However, in thorium, uh, enrichment is not necessary, so this of course benefits economically the reactor design because enrichment does cost quite some, uh, as well as the fact that because enrichment is not necessary, pretty much all of the fuel or the thorium that is being mined can be used as a fuel inside the reactor, increasing significantly the efficiency of these reactors to utilize their fuel. It is important to mention that even though no enrichment of thorium is necessary as uh, we already mentioned and as it is usually mentioned when uh, discussions happen around thorium reactors, it is important to know that a fissile material is used and it is necessary to be used in order to start up the reactor for the necessary neutrons to be produced to, uh, let's say, be captured by the thorium and then it being transmutated into uranium-333 into uranium-233 that is a fissile material and can therefore sustain a chain fission reaction. Therefore, the fact that no enriched material needs to uh, operate a thorium reactor is not true, but the thorium itself or the majority of the fuel itself is not necessary to be enriched. So the enriched amount that is necessary is quite small. Another important aspect when it comes to the economics of the molten salt reactors is the fact that since this is a molten salt core, there is uh, not a uh, high cost associated with uh, fuel manufacturing and fuel fabrication, such for example that there are in the current type of reactors that we are using where the fuel is solid, first of all need to be fabricated into pellets, then put inside the, the cladding, the fuel assemblies, 
Uh, we have to basically construct these spacers inside the core that the fuel assemblies are sitting inside. There's a lot of uh, fabrication going on, which of course adds additional costs. In the molded salt reactors, you can sort of uh, eliminate all of these costs by basically having a core which is just filled with molten uh, fuel, which is not so much reprocessed from the one that you mined from, from the mines. And the last important aspect when it comes to the economics of the molded salt reactors and specifically the LFTRs is the fact that refueling can happen online, meaning while the reactor is operated, new fuel can be added, which means no downtime for the reactor, which as we know, is one of the most expensive uh, ways that the nuclear industry loses money by having the reactor shut down for any sort of maintenance or refueling. So here we eliminate uh, this, uh, let's say, disadvantage while having refueling online, uh, having no losses when it comes to financial aspect. So moving on to the next aspect of our discussion, and this is the efficiency of the LFTR reactors and generally molten salt reactors as well. And uh, here, one very good and uh, positive outcome of a molten salt reactor design is the fact that since there's no structural components, as we discussed before, no cladding, no spacers, no fuel assembly that could possibly capture neutrons and therefore reduce the efficiency of the reactor and the amount of neutrons that can actually cause fission. In a molten salt reactor, this is not a problem since the whole core is simply filled with molten fuel. So all the neutrons that exist in the core are pretty much heating the fuel and fissioning the fuel existing in the core, hence producing electricity in a, let's say, more efficient way and not captured left and right from materials that are not supposed to be fissioned. It is commonly known that uh, thorium is a very good fuel for slow neutron uh, fission. And what that means is that typically uranium 233, which as we explained is a byproduct of thorium 232, is more efficient when uh, the neutrons have slowed down. However, there is a benefit and disadvantage to having a slow, let's say, uh, neutron speed. And uh, this can cause the breathing ratio, meaning that how many neutrons are produced compared to how many neutrons are consumed, being very close to actually being efficient or not. Therefore, usually people opt for fast neutron spectrum, meaning that the neutrons that are going to be produced are more than the neutrons that are going to be consumed. And in the fast spectrum, this is more probable and more possible. However, combining a fast spectrum with a thorium fuel is not the most optimum. Therefore, choices such as uranium and plutonium are being chosen instead. And moving on to the next aspect, and that would be the waste that is produced from uh, thorium reactors. And uh, here, since thorium is an element that has a smaller atomic number than uranium, meaning that we produce all kinds of elements in the periodic table that are below the thorium in the periodic table. Hence, we do not produce the transuranic elements, which are typical for the type of reactors that we are using now, and which are also the ones that are contributing to the very long times that it takes them to decay into radioactivity levels that are similar to the background. Hence, they need to be stored for hundreds of thousands of years in geological repositories. The th waste that we are going to be getting from thorium reactors is actually going to be less radioactive in the long term. And that means that their storage will probably be in the range of hundreds of years and not tens of thousands of years, which is a very good aspect, of course. However, the waste will be in the short term much more toxic and uh, more dangerous than it is from uh, uranium nuclear reactors. And the reason for that is, uh, for example, the fact that uh, the uranium-233, which is basically the fuel that is used for thorium reactors, uh, decays into elements that are highly radioactive emitting gamma radiation, which, uh, as you might know, is very hard to shield yourself from since it penetrates through pretty much a lot of material out there. And therefore, it is quite hard to handle this fuel and basically protect the workers and the environment from this gamma radiation. It is also important to mention that uh, it is quite easier to store solid fuel, such as the one that's uh, getting out of the reactors that we're currently using, compared to fuel in liquid form, especially in the fluoride form. These salts are quite corrosive and um, are very aggressive when it comes to their uh, contact, when it comes to the water. Therefore, they are not suitable for permanent geological repositories, as the ones that are being developed now for the fuels that we are currently have as spent and stored in the, in the storage pools. Therefore, we would need to develop some extra technology and some new, let's say, ways to store this uh, fluoride molten salts 
even though for the short period of time that they need to be installed. Moving on to most probably the most important aspect of discussion for the thorium reactors and that is the proliferation issues that are associated with this type of reactor. Even though once uh, you Google about thorium reactors, the let's say most important advantage that's being portrayed out there is the fact that they are so strongly non-proliferation designs and uh, that is true partly when it comes to the fact that uh, inside the reactor while the fuel is um, let's say the thorium uh, is transmuting to uranium-232 hence to uranium-233 and so on the gamma radiation is quite high which as we said requires shielding and because there is high gamma radiation they are hard to handle hence they are hard to like steal let's say this type of fuel and handle it in order to make bombs and uh, keep it from not melting by itself because of how high the temperatures are from the radiation that it is emitting. However, this is not the only problem when it comes to non-proliferation. It is important to mention that the thorium designs and the thorium reactors that have been designed in order to be breeders, meaning that in order to be sustained and produce their own fuel and not needing some fissile material uh, in order to operate, have one very important feature in order for them to be made feasible. And that feature is the fact that while thorium is uh, capturing a neutron and uh, transmuting into protactinium 233, this protactinium is basically the one that will decay into the fuel, the uranium 233, that it is necessary to, to have in the reactor in order for this fissile material basically to, to create fission and create energy. Now, usually what we discuss for the positive proliferation issues of the thorium reactors is that this uranium-233 has a small amount of uranium-232 inside with very high gamma radiation emitted and hence it's very hard to handle or steal this uranium-233. However, going a step back, it is important to mention that all or at least most of the designs of the thorium reactors that are out there suggest for the protactinium-233 to be removed outside of the core in order to not poison the core because it has a tendency to absorb a lot of neutrons, hence it can basically stop the self-sustained chain reaction. Uh, one then suggests to remove the protactinium, keep it outside of the core, let it decay to uranium which takes around 27 days and now that you have uranium-233 which is a fissionable material, you put it back in the reactor and the chain reaction keeps going and this is how basically the fuel is produced for the thorium reactor types. But the uranium-233 is a perfect weapons-grade material. There have been uh, tests out there with uh, nuclear bombs creating with a base of uranium-233 and they work perfectly fine. Therefore, this is a very big concern that is inherent to the design and the operation of thorium reactors. Now, it is important to understand that even though the stealing of the, let's say, fuel from a thorium reactor might not be such a plausible uh, case for discussing proliferation issues, the fact that the owner of the power plants and the thorium reactors themselves have the ability to produce weapons grade material that is perfectly separated from the rest of the reactor and can immediately be used to generate uh, weapons by uh, nuclear energy is a very big concern when it comes to these type of reactors and who is basically allowed to use them and who is not. Therefore, it is important to mention that, for example, thorium uh, is one of the protected elements by uh, IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, because of these proliferation concerns, even though, for example, uranium is not. And moving on to the last aspect of the LFTR reactor types, and this would be the current status, so what is happening out there currently. The biggest, let's say, uh, disadvantage that we currently have with thorium reactor types is the fact that we have little to no experience on how to operate them, what the problems are, uh, what might happen and how one would approach it because we never really build uh, commercial reactors that use thorium as a fuel. Even though there was an experiment in Oak Ridge, which you can read more about in the description uh, link down below, that uh, did work on um, a molten salt reactor type, uh, we don't really have significant experience that would give us the possibility to say with certainty that these reactor types are going to work, are going to actually be breeders instead of a typical reactor like the one we have now, so basically always needing new fuel. 
uh, to be uh, operational and all of the other benefits that we're basically discussing are good in paper but have never been proven or implemented in reality to work. Another important aspect as I mentioned in the waste section is the fact that we don't really have a way to store waste that comes out of a molten salt reactor as uh, it is quite different from the solid fuel that comes out of a let's say typical reactor that we are currently using hence this would add an uncertainty to the cost of the waste storage and management as well as to how are we supposed to do that exactly and an important thing to mention as well is that molten salt in itself is a quite corrosive material even more corrosive than lead and uh, therefore there is still a lot of research and development that is necessary and new materials that are needed to be basically developed and made for these kind of reactors in order to withstand the conditions that they are going to be under during the operation or basically the whole lifetime of the reactor itself. Currently plenty of countries such as China, India and Canada are interested in uh, thorium fueled reactor types and are pursuing their own designs and uh, planning to work with them in the future. I know that I'm going to get plenty of comments in the comment section asking but what do you think about the thorium reactors? I'm going to spare you the time and give you my opinion in this video. Uh, I do think that thorium as a fuel is very promising. Uh, we have it so we might as well develop some technology to use it in the future. However, I do see the limitations that are quite real with thorium and as long as there is no better design than the one that we are currently uh, having planned to implement. I don't see thorium as a fuel moving forward, mainly because of the proliferation issues that are associated with it. I also believe that uh, the thorium reactor types have a similar kind of philosophy and mentality of operation as the ones that plan to use the spent uranium fuel from the reactor types that we currently have. Therefore, if I was to invest in research and development in either of those technologies, I would much rather invest and develop reactors that could actually burn the spent nuclear fuel that we currently have stored and have pretty much nothing to do with uh, in order to minimize our nuclear waste on planet Earth instead of developing a whole new technology that might have its own limitations, will take its own delays, its own time and we're not sure how promising it will actually be at the end. Therefore, even though I do like the idea of thorium, I do believe that it is uh, currently not the main point of focus of the nuclear industry and uh, important research and development should and will continue on it. And of course, when the time is right and the designs are in place, that would basically prove its uh, safety in terms of proliferation issues, then we might as well implement it in the next generations to come. Thanks for watching this video. Let me know in the comment section down below what do you think and what's your opinion about thorium reactors. And uh, also let me know what kind of reactor types would you like me to explain in the future. Don't forget to like and subscribe and leave a comment down below. It's been Alina, your friendly nuclear physicist. And until next time, see you soon.